Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another episode of Cannabis Enlightened. I am your host, Dr. Leroy, and today we have an amazing guest with us to share his cannabis experience. Now, I want all of you to listen very carefully because this kind of interview only comes once in a long time. Um, my guest today is Dennis, Dennis Hunter, and he is an individual that has been in the cannabis space. I mean, ground level. And when I say ground level, I mean growing cannabis for a long time. I'm told over 30 years. Is that correct, Dennis? Yeah, that's correct. So, all right. So this is going to be um, a unique and amazing interview in a lot of different ways. And I want to uh, let the audience know that as I'm interviewing Dennis, and he's going to tell some pretty astounding stories about himself in the cannabis space. Um, and I want you to know right off the bat that he is not African-American. He is white. And uh, some of you, I have to say that because some of you may think that, well, gee, uh, Dr. Brady is, uh, Dr. Leroy is interviewing another African-American. No. In the trials and tribulations and experiences and adventures that Dennis has gone on, he has done them being white. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask Dennis to come on and um, introduce himself and tell us a little bit about who he is and um, what he does. Dennis, welcome. Uh, thank you. I'm looking forward to being on with you, and uh, it's, it's, it's quite an honor. Um, my name is Dennis Hunter. Uh, like like uh, Dr. Leroy just said, uh, been in the industry um, in cultivation of cannabis pretty much since I was in high school. Um, and so in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, uh, going to high school and basically uh, also growing. Um, so I came from an area uh, in the Emerald Triangle in Mendocino County. Uh, it's kind of a culture in that that town and that area that just there was so many either loggers or growers and um and i kind of like hanging out with the growers more than loggers at the time so uh so i just kind of took to cannabis and loved the plant and um and they, and then pretty much uh, the rest of my life was pretty much uh, revolved around cannabis in some way or another so dennis when you say loggers you're talking about uh, cutting down trees and the old axe or the saw. Yeah, you know. yeah. So up in that area, you have a lot of uh, forests and and trees, your fir trees and redwood trees, and and so um, so in those areas, you you have a lot of logging companies, and and, and especially in like the the eighties and nineties, uh, they did a lot of logging in those areas, and so you kind of had this weird cultural mix between these sort of hippie growers and these redneck loggers and and uh it, it made for a pretty pretty front childhood growing up um you know you yeah uh, growing weed and with a four-wheel drive truck you know so so give me a context uh dennis with respect to the year what year are we talk the years are we talking? yeah so this is uh, uh i graduated in uh 1990 from high school um i was growing while i was in high school uh oh, wow. so uh, kind of one way to get lunch money, you know? So. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. So now when you were growing, it's another thing I'm going to point out to our audience. Uh, if, if I can take that 1990, you graduated, you were growing. When you were growing, it was not legal. No, it wasn't legal. Um, you know, in, in that town, in that community, uh, you know, you had a culture of a lot of people that were growing. So it wasn't really looked at like negatively from most of the people uh, in that, in that area. And there were so many people kind of doing it in that, um, in, in that area that it, that it wasn't that big of a deal. Like it, um, so it, yeah, it was just kind of one of the things you did in those, in that kind of um, community. Sure. Sure. So is there a special type of cannabis that you were growing or how did you, how did you know that what you were growing was going to be good? Yeah, you, it's you kind of just similar to what it is now. You have breeders that bred or somebody that got seeds from Amsterdam or, you know, had this strain or that strain. And and so you would get seeds from different people and, and grow it from there. Um, year after year, you would just learn more about the different strains that you liked and how they did in that climate and things like that. Um, 
you know, when I was growing, I it wasn't like I was growing on my own property. My parents weren't, weren't cool with cannabis. Um, so we basically, what I would do is I'd go out and hike through the woods and find like a spring that was coming out of the side of the hill. And then I'd build a spring box to collect water and tie a, a line into it. And I used chicken wire and wrapped it in between some trees and lined it with plastic and filled it up with water and hooked on a little timer and it would water the garden. I'd go around to the south side of the hill with, with black poly pipe and put drippers in to where I put all the plants and kind of made, I kind of thinned out a little bit of areas in the bushes and, and planted and pushed all the things out to the side to keep the deer and, and you know, animals from kind of destroying the plants. So it was totally like renegade, go out into the <laughs> woods and create a little area from, wow. from a spring to, to grow. So it was, you know, um, it was a lot of fun because you're like out there, you're sneaking out, trying to walk out without leaving a trail where, where you're, uh, you're kind of, we call them patches back then where your patch was because if some stranger found it, they might take it. Um, so you're trying to hide it. You're trying to hide it from, you know, people that are walking around or hunters or, or hide it from the helicopters. Once back then you had camp, um, which is campaign against marijuana planting. It was kind of the federal government giving grants to have these teams go in, uh, to, to look for cannabis with helicopters. And, um, so you, 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 you always had to gamble, like how far out did you put the plants outside of the trees where mm -hmm. they could be seen from the helicopters? Um, or, or, or if you put them too far under the trees, they didn't get enough sun. So you're always gambling with how much risk you were willing to do by putting the plants out and get more sun. Now, you, you know, what's amazing me is that you were doing this at a young age. It sounded like, uh, 17, 18 or yeah. younger than that. Yeah. Even 16, probably 16, 17, 18. So how did you know that this, you know, that the cannabis was going to be good? I mean, is it trial and error or did you just have a knack for it? No, it's just, it's, it is trial and error. You know, I, I learned how to do it from some older guys that were doing it. Um, they took me and showed me their, their gardens that they had set up. And so I was like, oh, wow, this is really cool. As I got a little tour through, you know, somebody's older brother's uh, garden. And, and I'm just like, and I was, I was one of those like kind of um, jack of all trades, my, my, dad always taught me how to do everything, building, plumbing, you know, sheet rock, doesn't matter. Uh, and so I had all these skill sets. And so, you know, growing what's, you know, oh, there's some plumbing of running this pipe around the hill and, and just, you know, being able to put things together. And so I just kind of had a knack to just get it done. And, and so once I seen it, somebody else do it, it I, I just kind of, you know, copied what they did and, and then learned, you know, learned from there. Okay. Well, take us through your first grow. Or your first successful grow because i'm assuming that maybe the first time you 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 grew some cannabis maybe it didn't turn out right and then finally you got a pretty good crop yeah what did you do well the, the first one was in my friend's backyard uh okay. his parents were cool and <laughs> um with, with cannabis so we grew some big plants in his backyard and um his dad kind of showed us what to do and and we grew i don't know five or 10 pounds of, of cannabis back then it was, you know, it's, we, it definitely wasn't the best, but it was okay. And, um, we sold it, but we also, we went out one day, um, one night and, uh, we kind of, I, I grabbed a, my, my dad's like service truck, you know, once with toolboxes on it, mm -hmm. I kind of snunk out, took it out, kind of joyriding with wow. some friends. And he, he got his mom's LTD, big old boat car. Uh, <laughs> and we that. were, we were out by the railroad tracks trying to kind of jump them over this little hump and kind of just getting rowdy as, you know, 16 year old kids. And, mm -hmm. um, and I ran my dad's service truck into his mom's LTD and it Ooh. just smashed up the trunk and everything. So that first harvest, <laughs> uh, went to buy his mom a new car <laughs> and fix my dad's service truck. So, oh, um, but, that's hilarious. That's hilarious. Okay. With the second crop, <laughs> how did you, okay. Second crop you have is successful. And you, you uh, pick the flower. Yeah. Yeah. We, it was again uh, out in the, the, the second one was out in the Hills where it was just total uh, clandestine little grow out in the Hills where I had to, to, I had to walk in nutrients and, and wow. all the stuff for it and was able to, to harvest it. I dried it out in the woods too, yeah. under trees. And, and then yeah, my friends and I just paid them to come up with me 
on the trees and trim it. <laughs> so we'd go out oh with lanterns and hang out all night and, you know, drink beer and, and trim the, the flower out because we couldn't bring it home because my mom would be pissed, right? So I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't bring it anywhere. So we literally did the whole process out in the woods and, uh, and then wow. got, you know, a handful of pounds out of it and sold it and, you know, uh, had kind of had money as a young kid. Wow. Um, and from there on, I was kind of addicted and just, it was kind of my whole life revolved around it. So I can just imagine, um, let's go work for Dennis Hunter. Um, he pays us money and he gives us beer. <laughs> wow. You probably never had a problem with finding people to help you. No, no, no. I don't, there's no, no problem with that. Okay. You know, we always had a good time when we were doing it. So it was kind oh, of, great. it was more of a lifestyle almost. You're, you know, like yeah. I was saying, it's so much fun. You can just imagine like, you know, it's a lot of work, but you're, you're like hiking out to go check on it. It was always exciting because sometimes I wouldn't see it for two or three days. And, and so you're coming, you're going through, you're trying not to leave a trail going through the woods and then you get to the patch and you kind of walk, walk around that corner to see the plants. And they're like another foot taller than they were last time you seen them. And, um, and it was exciting. And even the part of, you know, trimming and selling it and just kind of all, everything around it, it just was the culture and the, and, um, and just, had we had a blast and you know you did it other friends were doing it and it just uh, uh really kind of turned into a lifestyle so i was going to say it's a lifestyle it's a culture it's nothing unusual right okay so you you did your second crop um how much did you make i'd make uh 20 000, 30 000, somewhere and you know something like that wait a minute twenty thousand dollars yeah so you're a young kid and you're not 20 yet, and you're growing something out of the earth, and you're cultivating it, and you're manicuring it, you're cutting it, and you found a way to make $20,000? Yeah, probably more, probably more. More? Yeah. How often? Um, back then, it was mostly once a year, so you, because you weren't okay. doing light depth, it wasn't indoor, so okay. you, you had kind of one crop in, you know, October, November, uh, you would take it down and, and you kind of got what you got. Sometimes uh, a ripoff would find it and you wouldn't even get the crop off. So you spend all year growing it and then lose it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's all these those ups and downs sure. and, and some of you like, oh, you made that much money. Well, you, maybe you lost it all. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not all, it's not all, okay. you know, that it's, it, it's, uh, it's the trials and tribulations that come along with sure. it as well. And, you know, it's, uh, yeah, at times you're just, you got your flush with money because you just harvested and and it's funny because some people go broke all year long and then they get their money right at harvest and they spend it all in three or four months <laughs> and they're broke for the rest of the year until they harvest again wow okay what are we buying now what so you're you're not 20 years old yet or maybe around 20 yeah i'm probably i don't know probably at 17 i i okay. actually i got enough that i put a down payment and i bought a house um and you bought a house at 17 house and fixed it up and okay. rented it out at renters uh, renters that were like twice my age <laughs> oh my god wait a minute wait a minute you're telling me that at a young age you were an entrepreneur yeah uh growing and 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 trimming and preparing cannabis and you were uh, in that regard you're an entrepreneur and then you were another entrepreneur because you bought you were a landlord yeah. you bought houses fixed them up and you rented them to people that were twice your age yeah Oh my God, that's amazing. That's amazing. Okay, so let's 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 fast forward a little bit. Uh, you had been doing this for several years, and I'm thinking that you were getting pretty good at it. Yeah, I tell you, one of those things. Like, you know, I've been growing for thirty something years. Sure. And, but it's with cultivation and growing cannabis. It's. It, I think maybe it's why we get so addicted to growing and loving this plant is it's always hard to understand. And I feel like even like you, I'm still learning, uh, like every year teaches you another thing or something else goes wrong that you have to figure out how to, how to fix. And so it's one of those, it's a, it's a lifelong lesson that's being teached to you, you know? And, and so, yeah, you get better, but, but never do you get it figured out all the way. You, you, know? you know, Dennis, I'm glad you said that because many people that I come in contact with a lot of students that I used to teach when I, I was teaching the business of cannabis and still, you know, now I talk to people, they find out what I do and they say, oh, I want to go in the, I want to be a cultivator. You know, I want to grow and I want to get rich. And you're letting me know um, on, you know, this podcast, on the episode 
that it's not a piece of cake. It takes time to develop the techniques to be a good grower. Yeah, absolutely. And then then there's things outside of your control that happen sometimes too. And so a lot of times you're limiting how many things outside your control that that can happen. And so uh, and then some people first time first crop, they just knock it out of the park. And I'm like, oh, man, you're ruined for the rest of your life. You like, you're have all disappointments from here on out. Oh, wow. OK, so now at that time, you weren't so much con, uh, concerned with CBD or, or, or THC. I, I, I'm thinking that the THC was the thing. Yeah, no one even knew what CBD was um, back then. Um, it was several years after that, that that the other cannabinoids started, you know, to be, you know, more not people had more knowledge about them and things like that. So so it, we didn't really even think about that. There were just different strains and, and stuff that we'd grow. Find, you know, sativa and indica was was yeah. that there's another ruderalis was a kind of that weird stepchild one of of the that, that would grow and tell it, us about that it, it's a it's just it it's a plant and now i think maybe a lot of the auto flowers and things come from it um it was one that would just start flowering right off the bat it would only get a few feet tall mm. and so uh I, I went to amsterdam at one point and got some seeds and and, um, and so I came back and I had a couple of ruderalis seeds and, and, uh, it was like, oh my gosh, these things started flowering right, pretty much right after I planted them. And, and so it was just this kind of weird plant at the time. We didn't really understand a lot about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so, so you kind of had the indica sativa, that's kind of how you judge things. And, you know, a lot of times it seemed like the, the indicas could finish a little bit early. The sativas went long and got mm -hmm. tall and kind of more skinny, long leaves and stuff like that. So w was your education mostly the experience or did you, were you reading books or articles or talking to other growers? Yeah, so I, yeah, definitely tried to learn as much as I could and and, and took a, advice from people. And I, a lot of times I seemed like I hung out with a lot of older people than myself. And and so I, I got really great experiences uh, from going up to places and seeing huge grows and, and it just gave me more ideas to expand and, and go larger. And, and, uh, and it was, you know, kind of cowboying it out there uh, for, for many years. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now um, it sounds like you were doing really well in the cannabis space growing. And it sounds like you, you also started cultivating and in a way started the processing, I guess, maybe? No, no, that didn't, um, extraction, even back then there, you know, people didn't do a lot of extraction. Uh, it was really wasn't around, uh, people were smoking flour and, and stuff like that. I think probably it was probably in the mid nineties, late nineties that I, I really seen some first, uh, cannabis oil, you know, and people are kind of, you know, hot knifing, uh, you know, heating up knives and, and kind of hot knifing, uh, you know, uh, oil that they had Lock, gotten right. and stuff like that. So it was very kind of rudimentary, uh, you know, ways of, of, um, you know, smoking, smoking, uh, cannabis oil. Okay. Now in your heyday at the, 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 the apex where you were really doing well, how much cannabis were you growing and, and what was that producing in terms of dollars and cents? Yeah, so I kept going and growing a little bit larger. It was like kind of always a challenge. And there would be a lot of money that would come. And it seems like it would always kind of flow through your hands a, a lot. I don't know. <laughs> like, like you used it to go bigger and, and, and buy property or do something to to keep expanding. It doesn't seem didn't seem like it ever like just stuck with you like <laughs> uh, you would you would think. Um, but uh, you know, I I'd seen, you know, I had some grows where they, they were pretty large and it could be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars that we were growing that year and, right. and, and even larger at, at, at times. And, you know, I, back probably when I was 22, uh, I bought this property. And so I'm kind of going to go from, you know, growing that gorilla, gorilla style growing out just in national forest or state forest mm -hmm. or wherever and, and actually buy property where I'm growing. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, and then we, I was literally getting ready to do it and we had planted all these plants and, um, and one rainy day, um, uh, had the sheriffs come in and, and raid the, raid the property. And 
uh, I took off running, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, kind of ran up through the woods and, and had to turn myself in later. And, and then I, uh, ended up getting, uh, sentenced to seven and a half months in the County jail in Mendocino County at 22 years old. And, and, uh, but I was just, I was in there, I was serving the time and, and I was literally planning my next grow, you know, I like, <laughs> I was, I like had a piece of paper. I was drawing out all the different things I was going to do. So and, jail didn't deter you. No, no, no. It was uh, just a place to, to meet other, other, uh, growers and, <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, and, and so we, I basically got out and I moved to Humboldt County and I, I had this whole plan. I'm like, man, I don't, I'm going to get caught again. So I, I decided to build an underground indoor grow. Oh my gosh. Um, and I literally went, rented a backhoe and dug a hole, like, and had a contractor guy help me and poured a slab and built cinder block walls and put a barn on top of it. I even put little horse stalls out around it. So it looked good and had a generator that was running to, to power it. Um, and, and it's, it would, and so I did this big indoor grow and then bought another property and put in, you know, more grows on that outdoor grow that started buying property all over this whole area up in Humboldt. Mm -hmm. And I had outdoor grows just everywhere. And, and then I built another huge indoor grow that had, you know, several hundred lights. And, and at that time that was huge right now, you know, with the, in the regulated cannabis, yeah. that's like, Oh, that's like a mediocre little sure. grow, but, but back in, you know, the, the mid nineties, um, 300 lights was unheard of uh, and, you know, powering it all with a diesel generator mm -hmm. and, and out in the middle of nowhere. And, um, and so I did that for several years. And, and like I said, the money comes in, well, I bought properties, right? So I kept mm -hmm. buying all these properties with money I was making. And, sure. then, and then, you know, one, one terrible day, uh -oh. uh, I, I met these, uh, these strangers walking down the road and I didn't meet them. They, I had to go find them Cause one of my, the guys that was working with me seen them. And so we went and kind of looked and found them hiding in the woods and I walked them off the property and they told me they were cutting firewood out there. And, um, pretty soon, um, I asked them for ID and I was getting upset cause they wouldn't give me their ID. And I was like, well, you're trespassing. And and I told them I was going to put them under citizen's arrest and they <laughs> kind of chuckled a little bit. And, uh, one of them pulled out a gun and, uh -oh. and, a, and, a, and pulled out a necklace badge and he's, uh, DEA. Oh like, and so just like I always do, I ran, uh, I took off running, uh, went across the road, running through the woods and, um, and I had a, uh, my, my wife and a newborn baby back at this house that I just built. So I ran there and I got him in the car and I told him to go out the back road. And, and then I went down to, to the big indoor that I built right. and I had all these trimmers. There like 12 people trimming there. And I'm like, you know, got them out and told them to walk out down to the woods and get out of there. And, um, and then pretty soon all of sheriffs and DEA, all of them came in and I, I, I took off and went and got an attorney and my attorney's looking at it. There were so many plants there. There at the time, there was twelve thousand plants. Oh um, my! It was huge. It was the like biggest indoor bust in Humboldt history at the time. And and uh, it, there was there was news camera crews that came and filmed it all. It was there were I had people on the East Coast seeing the the news media talking about it because I built it like a facade, so it, made it looked like there was playgrounds and all this stuff around this big building. And so they go, oh, you know, they they walk through with the news crew, like, oh, you know, here up in the middle of nowhere and humble, <laughs> da, da 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 da, you know, and and do this whole news story. And I'm just like, oh man, I am in so much trouble. Like, wow. what am I gonna do? And I went and talked to a uh, attorney. Um, I uh, and he's seen the indictment, and he's like, man, this is gonna be. <laughs> You're, you're in trouble. You, if I were you, I'd just take your, your wife and your kid and go to Canada and you need, you should get out of here. <laughs> these, these feds don't play. Wow. And so, so I, I went on the run. I um, became a fugitive. Oh my. And so I changed my name. I got passports for me, my wife and, and young daughter. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all different, you know, people that I 
knew from you know away from me a little bit i sure. gave them money to let me use their their id and their 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 identity and went and got real driver's license and real passports and oh my and uh so i became oh. josh abrams for for four and a half years josh abrams yeah oh my goodness for how long for four and a half years yeah and so i tr i tried to go to canada but i got to the border and and they tore apart this motorhome that i was trying to get in with and uh i the name that i had josh abrams and uh, my wife and kid had different last names Ooh. all because of the passwords mm -hmm. right and so they're like i guess there's a lot of times where uh a mother may take their kid up to Canada trying to get away from the husband or mm -hmm. whatever. So they want to talk to the father of the, of my daughter, which I am, but not, not really with this yeah. passport thing. Right. Sure. And so they couldn't get a hold of them and the stories didn't right line up and they rejected me. They literally had that, you know, that little square box with the red yeah. rejected. They stamped my, <laughs> my entry form and then turned me around and, and sent me back into the U S and then, U.S. Customs, like, why did they reject you? They tore apart the motor home as well. I was sweating bullets for a couple of hours, and I was like, man, okay, I'm not going to Canada. Um, so I shaved my head, grew a goatee, and and came back down into Sonoma County hmm. and kind of, you know, started trying to figure out what to do. Um, okay. I need to make a living, and all I know how to do is grow. So I was just, like, setting up indoor grows for people and catching a little cut of it and and stuff for for years and started a nutrient company um, mm -hmm. called uh, cutting edge solutions which now is kind of a large nutrient company for cannabis and, and it belongs to you it, it, it did at the time okay when i started but it. you sold it i i had some partners and, <laughs> okay and uh and they kept it running and it's still going and it's a oh, great, great great business and and so i just kind of did things around it and mm -hmm. and uh kind of moved around i opened a couple dispensaries um as kind of the you know silent partner and and still very involved in cannabis mm -hmm. and um and then really tried to help i was i was like and the only thing i'm gonna get the only way i can get out of trouble is if this thing's legal someday and so i really started supporting that kind of legalization movement mm -hmm. and and got behind to, uh, and tried to support that um and then four and a half years later but even before then um i think that you did more than the i think you did um, you talked about doing so many months, but you yeah, did some no. so you're, greater you're, time, didn't you? Yeah. So that's why I say I was on the run for four and a half years because right. it all has to end one day, right? Yeah. So yeah. So after four and a half years, um, the DEA caught up with me and arrested me, um, and I got sentenced to seven and a half years or six, six and a half years in in federal prison, um, which you know I thought. Was, felt like eternity it's my life everything is is falling apart my my wife left me it was like oh my god the worst you know feeling you could have just like oh like well you know the world's over and for a while you don't even know what you're going to get sentenced to so it was it was horrible time um but you know i literally it got so stressed and and in just depressed and and so i literally i was like having my hair fall out i'm sleeping and it's like wake up or there's like hair on my pillow oh, and man. it just stress was just wow. eating me alive and um and at one point i was just like i'm gonna like kill myself of of just by by just like stress, stress and support, and sure. i just had to kind of pull myself out of it and and uh and i got to a spot where it's just like okay you know i gotta make the best of it and you know kind of got my mindset kind of let go of the outside world and and you know when people talk about doing hard time when with like hard timing it when you're in there is the people that are stressing and everything is there and then you know over time you start to like let the world go outside and mm. and then then the time gets much easier you know you you try to keep yourself busy you get routines that help you kind of get through the days mm -hmm. and, and you know then then all of a sudden those days that would drag on they feel like months all of a sudden you know now the months feel like days because you you you're able to kind of let it all go and, mm -hmm. and things like that um so i had to i had to really um you know change my mindset and learn about myself and figure out okay i'm in a bad situation but what am i going to do with it and and uh yeah it was so you did the, you did the six years yeah the whole full six years mm -hmm. and then you were you were let go and what year was that um it was 2000 
two. I went in in two thousand eight. I got out. Two, you got out in two thousand eight. Uh, when you got out, what did you start doing? So I got out, and you know, I'm on federal probation, right? So can't go grow weed anymore. So I, I, um, I told you I started that nutrient company back okay. in the day. And so I'm like, what do I know a lot about? And I know a lot about cultivation. Mm -hmm. And so um, I started a, I started um, making uh, cultivation products for cultivators and, and, uh, so gardening products, but more tailored towards growing cannabis. Sure. Um, and so I, I, uh, I started doing that and I started making my own branded growing pots and my own branded turkey bags and my own branded like nutrients and, you know, uh, stimulants that's for like, for, you know, all the like amendments for growing cannabis that would bring out more terpenes mm -hmm. and, and things like that. And so I, I kind of got this cool experience of actually creating brands and, mm. and in the, in the, in the cultivation supply space. Okay. Um, and pretty soon I, I started distributing those because uh, myself, and then I started distributing other people's products and created a distribution company for, for cannabis products. So in, in, um, so in you bounced phase. back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It took a while. It took a while. Okay. All right. So now, 2008 you're out and you're you're starting to reinvent yourself and um i'm i'm assuming that a few years went by and uh you you said that you started working to um try to make cannabis legal mm -hmm. okay in california and your actions worked out okay because in i believe uh 2016 or before then? Yeah. Um, so yeah, 2000. Well, if we if we kind of keep on that that run of, I was on federal probation for five years. Okay. Um, and doing the cannabis supply, like cultivation supplies, and mm -hmm. um, that I was also watching it because I'm selling to growers. I'm selling into this industry, and I'm watching the industry sort of start to develop we're still in the kind of prop 215 days of right of medical marijuana and mm -hmm. and and they're letting people grow 96 plants or 30 plants depending on what county you're in mm -hmm. and so i'm watching it and i'm sort of i'm selling them you know i'm selling you know shovels to the to the to the miners kind of thing <laughs> uh, right i can't do it but okay. i can sell them the shovels you right know? Um, right and so i'm doing that but i'm also because i'm doing that i'm 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 very much paying attention to kind of how the industry is developing and i'm starting to see different things and you're starting to see vape pens and and you're starting to see these almost like branded products start to hit you mm -hmm. know some of these dispensary shells when the dispensaries first started in 96 so much of it was just flour and i mean jars of flour and just you know it was very it was very crude and and mm -hmm. kind of um but but now it, at this time you're really seeing like these people branding they've got baked goods that are actually packaged and 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 different things so i'm mm -hmm. i'm watching it but i'm i'm supplying the farmers and and uh and so five years later uh i get off probation um mm -hmm. and you know one of one of my biggest customers i used to sell to all the hydroponic stores but my biggest customer was this guy named ned fussell ah and he's he's growing just plant he's growing he's got gardens all over the county he's doing this a little bit crazy all over the place and i'm and he's he's buying more supplies from me as a distributor than my retail partners are as as these hydroponic stores and and he's asking me stuff about you know what i've done and advice and and uh, he's buying all this product and and i'm like man i'm about to get off probation da, 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 da. And, and i'm like have you seen those vape pens and and some of the, you know like the branded products I've just now created all these brands in the hydroponic supply chain to, to for that. And I'm like, Hey, what do you think about going and we'll go in on an extractor with me and we'll go extract some of this cannabis and make some of these products. You know, I have a lot of experiences branding products and in kind of, you know, developing brands. Um, you're, you're obviously, you know, out here growing and, and have a great team. And so that was the beginning of Canacraft. We, uh, we literally met because he, I was selling him all of his growing supplies and uh, we bought a, uh, our first extractor together, um, extracted cannabis. I was sitting there in the warehouse trying to figure it out. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and he was supplying all the, the flour and stuff that we were extracting. Um, and we kind of, you know, stumbled through it till we figured it out. And, 
um, and created a, a couple of great brands uh, with Absolute Extracts and Care by Design. And and Ned Fussell is your your partner, is a co-founder of Canacraft. Um, and as you were talking about, the brands that you have created are, I understand, award-winning brands. Yeah, yeah, we've definitely won uh, many awards over the years, and and uh, this last year. Uh, we we uh, we we got more than our share of awards. Uh, it was amazing at the Emerald Cup um, with uh, several of our brands, uh, Hi Fi Hops, uh, with the Lagunitas collaboration we do, we have the best beverage uh, with Care by Design, this tincture, and um, and then Flower with Farmer and the Felon. Mm. Uh, we we won. I think five different awards for for our outdoor flower. That's an interesting uh, name, farmer and the felon. I wonder where that came yeah, from. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I wonder. <laughs> Fantastic. So it was like an experiment, you know, just growing up, trying to, you know, make some extra money. Then you got into it more. And then the more you got in, into it, uh, it was illegal. You wound up doing some time. But then, you know, it's kind of like a Cinderella story. It, you know, it, it turned out that uh, when cannabis became illegal, um, you and, and Ned were in the business and doing well and have received um, a ton of awards. I mean, yeah, and we have, and it's been an amazing ride and it's always, and it's never that easy, right? Um, <laughs> um, you know, it, and, it, and, it, and some people ask me like, why did you keep doing it? You went to prison, you know, you went to jail for a while and then you went to prison and then you're back doing it again. Um, you know, and I, I think there's a piece of this that, that I, I kind of was like rebelled against it. Um, cause I, cause I also didn't feel that it, that it should be illegal. And I felt when I was in jail, I was just like, it's such bullshit. Why is this, why is this, you know, this plant illegal? I, I've seen it. I know that it's helped so many people and, you know, been involved in a lot of dispensaries in the early Prop 215 days where I've watched it change people's lives for the better. But then here it is a schedule one drug and it's, and you're going to put people in jail and take them away from their kids uh, because they're, they're growing this natural plant that's amazing and has all these properties and so you know i think i had a, a chip on my shoulder like you took mm. a big chunk of my life away um and so i kind of came at it when i you know uh, when i got out and i had these plans i i was laser focused that i i was going to you know this was going to be part of my life and there was a little bit of sort of proving the, that point um by by you know getting into the industry and continuing to do it and not letting it knock me out because of their poor decision of making this this wonderful plan illegal. Wow, what a, what a tremendous success story and a story of tenacity, determination that you you weren't deterred because you really believed in and you still believe in cannabis as a, a product that should be legal and that uh, is helpful. It's medicine. And I've always taught that cannabis is medicine. The fact that you get high from THC is it's kind of like a byproduct of it because as, as you alluded to earlier, so many other cannabinoids that are, are very helpful to people. And some of the products that you've developed are, are produced, designed, invented to help people, to help them get over pain. Um, your design by care is, is absolutely marvelous. I've used it myself and I know many of the listeners have used it. So uh, we have you to thank for that. Yeah. Yeah. No. And it's, it's great to be able to create products that you see change people's lives. Like, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm, we, we look at on our website and we get responses from people that literally they tell you that like, Oh my God, I was wasting away. And this, uh, this, this helped me so much. And, and, and change, it's, 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 it's just what a great, um, you know, blessing to have, to be able to be involved in an industry where you can do something like that. And, and, and to be in an industry that's so young and immature right now and, there's so many challenges that challenge us, but, but there are also experiences that you can only get if you're kind of on this bleeding edge of this industry and, yeah. um, and, and stuff. So, and then there's also this piece, I, when we were just talking about, you know, the name farmer and the felon, mm -hmm. um, this brand is, is really, we, we, we developed the brand. This was really to kind of talk about the, the story of our company and the, and the, the, the fact that, that I'm a felon. Um, 
and that that I lost time in in jail and and there's still so many people in jail right now over 40,000 people in jail right now for nonviolent cannabis offenses we have them we have them postered up on right. up Canacraft. you probably see them on that seen wall it. yes um we kind of did some letter write, writing campaigns because one thing when you're in jail you're you know it's, it's a lonely place to be and and you know one 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 thing that mm. that is what everybody looks forward to in jail is that mail call oh. and getting those letters from the outside knowing that people still remember you care about you and um and and so it's just a uh you know i and i i just couldn't even imagine being in jail right now with a developed industry like this to, like we got brands we got there's billboards all over the place. And can you imagine being locked up for cannabis? People win right awards. Now? It, it went awards. Going in award. <laughs> for uh, growing and, something. And, that, and, and yeah. I might even be, I might even be able to have an advantage to get a license uh, mm -hmm. because I went to jail. Exactly. And it's like, wait, what are we forgetting? There's still 40,000 people sitting in prison right now for cannabis. And, and it's like, are we running with this whole thing over here? I mean, I think we just didn't we just um yeah. uh the basketball player uh in russia i think yeah. that was in there for cannabis yeah, right Brittany. we just did a trade the federal government just did a trade to get her out of russia which i'm glad they did but you when you think about it i was just talking to somebody earlier today about it i was like what a weird thing where federal government just got her out from a, having a vape pen and and get her out from a, a crazy sentence in russia yeah. but what is happening right here in the u.s You've got people sitting in jail doing life or or 40 years or 60 years for cannabis offenses that are happening right here. And it's just like a, a really uh, we really when we started the farmer and the felon brand, what we really wanted to do is is create some messaging, you know, using the brand to inform people that there's still people sitting in jail. It's not done just because we're seeing all this. It feels like it's legal. It's not federally. It's still a schedule one drug. And people are still sitting in prison, and so um, as as we uh, as we keep going here, um, I think we have to shine the light on that and and try to get these people out of jail. Absolutely, I I noticed uh, um, that you are a um, member of the advisory board for the Last Prisoner Project, um, and you've all not only have you donated your 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 presence, but also I see I've I, I noticed that the Farmer and the Felon brand. Is it's a sponsor for that project, and I applaud you for that. Yeah, um, and, also, and those guys are, and, yeah. and they're great. They're, yeah. uh, um, it's great being on that advisory board there because I get to see some of the good work they're doing, and yeah. and they 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 are getting people out of jail, and they're creating you know policies that for whole states where they can hopefully get a big chunk of people out of jail, um, the, whether it's just one or whether it's a group in a whole state, um, they're doing some great policy work. And I, I would I would encourage everybody to help support them because they're on the ground floor really trying to make the changes to get them out. I, I noticed when I was in your facility and you've got a, a large, beautiful, large, productive facility up in um, Santa Rosa. And, and in one of your buildings, uh, an entire wall, and these are not small buildings. How many square feet do you have in that, that main building there? Yeah, it's about 45,000 square feet. 45,000 in that one. And I, I know you have several other buildings mm -hmm. which you um, do- um, Distribution. Distribution, and, and you, yeah. you dry the flower and so forth. And how, how, much, how big are those? Uh, it's probably a, a all together, um, all of it's probably around 75,000 square feet. 75,000 square feet. And one of those, the main building um, uh, you were talking about, there is an entire wall. And I kept, or I walked that wall and, and I tried to read all of the, there's a picture of the individual that's in prison and a write-up, um, a sincere write-up that if you, if you stand there too long and read those, yep. you start crying. Yep. Absolutely. I mean, you can't just read those uh, captions and think, oh, well, that's uh, just the way it goes. I mean, these are real people. Real people with real families, you yeah. know, and, you know, as hard as it is for that inmate, um, you can imagine being, you know, that being your father that's in, in jail and have to grow up without a father or, or a mother and, and stuff. So absolutely. Well, I, I think you're doing some, not I think, I know you're doing some amazing work in, in the cannabis space, and I applaud you for that. And I, I thank you for giving some of your time to talk with us about uh, cannabis. And something new has happened with Canacraft. Canacraft has merged, I think, with March and Ash. 
Yeah, yeah, we're we're really excited. We're, we've uh, merged with uh, one of our best retail partners uh, that we've we've been working with for several years, and and um, and just the culture fit between the founders of March and Ash and Canica. Um, we when we got together, we really felt like, oh my gosh, we are so much alike, and <laughs> and uh, it 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 really uh, is is amazing um, having. Um, partners like these guys and the work that they've done down here in San Diego, mm -hmm. um, you know, with the communities, it's like when we first started to, it was like the, you know, the stigma around cannabis, we had to battle that for many years. And, and so in doing that, we had to let people know who we are. And a lot of times you, what we did and what March Nash does is, is get out in that community and get to know them and do community projects and, and really, you know, show them. And pretty soon people would come, we do it with tours at Canacraft we tour through people that they might hate cannabis, but I give them a tour through Canacraft and show them the products that we make. And they're like, and they go, wow, this is, this is not what I expected. This is, mm. this is like any product, like, you know, this is what they had in their minds and what they had of the people being this, these evil people or something that, sure. that, that, you know, and the media and the, and the government have, have really done us a disservice of how they've painted this industry. And, and stuff and so the best way to change people's mind is to to get out there and show them and and have them meet you and and uh i, I literally i just you would see that you just change their minds right. um spending just a little bit of time with people and then you see and letting them see you out in the community actually that you care about the community and you're right you're you're there to support it um and so it really changes things and it, that's really what we see in that culture um bring the, the two companies right. together. I can really say uh, amen to that because I have uh, been a participant in a tour that you gave at Canacraft and watched you give tours. And it appears as though every tour is fresh. I mean, it's not like, okay, here I go again. This is this, this is that. You're excited. And, and you must have done this tour, God, a thousand times? A lot of times. Well, a lot of times. <laughs> a lot of times, but it is exciting because you know, I, I, it, it, it's, we worked so hard to, to build it. And, and there, like I said, it, it was never easy. There was, there was turmoils. We, at one point we had cops come into Canacraft and kick all the doors in and, and put me in jail on a $5 million bond. Mm. And it's like, what, talk about a bad day at Canacraft, you know? And, um, but what came out of it, we went and got the laws changed for manufacturing and, and uh, you know, sometimes bad things happen, but they happen because you need to react to it and change what's going on. And so, so with, with really bad days came good days after that, where, where you've seen change happen. Mm -hmm. I'm going to refer to you now as a cannabis activist. Now, you're a real community cannabis activist, Dennis Hunter. Uh, once again, I want to thank you for being so gracious with your time and, and giving us some stories and, um, reactions, experiences that you had in, in cannabis. The listening audience, if they if they want to get in touch with you, how would they contact you? Yeah, I um through through our website, um, I think getting messaging through there. Um mm -hmm. we and we also, you know, we do tours up at Canacraft. So if they ever find themselves in Santa Rosa and and can contact us, um it's one of the things we we kind of have a sort of an open door policy and um try to try to bring as many people through as possible. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dennis. Once again, I want to thank you. Um, you've been listening to Dennis Hunter. He is co-founder of Canacraft, now part of a large organization that includes uh, March and Ash, um, spending some time with us, letting us know his travels through cannabis from high school to where he is now, um, a journey that had some ups and downs, but, but now I think um, he feels like He's helping people to better themselves through something natural, cannabis flower. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm your host, Leroy Brady. You've been listening to Cannabis Enlightened. You can hear this episode and all of the episodes that are included on uh, the podcast by um, tuning in to CannabisEnlightened.com. Thank you very much, everybody. Olas Media.